All right, let's see. Um, right. Well, it's good to be back with all of you again. Glad that we could have this time together. And uh, let me have a word of prayer before we begin. Father in heaven, again, we thank you for this opportunity to come and to fellowship and to pray and to ask that you please watch over us. I know, dear God, that um, there are many things we'd like to share, and I ask that you help me to um, to um, continue to be faithful and guide my words and my thoughts. Now, through Christ our Lord, come, dear Lord, and visit us. And thank you for this time. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. <clears throat> I want to continue on in our series uh, dealing with the uh, last days of verse history. And um, we're thankful that we can have this time uh, together. Let me just say um, one thing before I begin. Jude, the battery is the recorder, not this. It's this one. Yeah. And I'm getting low. It's okay. It's no, there's no extra battery in there. It's a, having little difficulties here. Just bear with me just for a second and we'll be right there with you. Um, the, the thing that I just want to go back to what we were talking about, you know, she makes it clear uh, as well as the scriptures that there's coming a day we're going to have to um, let me just get out of this real quick. Hang on one second. Let me get out. Okay. Go ahead and grab that. Oh, okay. Right. Um, right. There we go. Beautiful. Wonderful. We were looking at the issue of what is um, to be expected in regard to what's coming. And we're going to be confronted with the issue that, you know, prosecution in some form or fashion is going to come when to those who are faithful to the Lord that we must realize that um, we're going to be confronted with some very serious consequences as a result of being faithful to the Lord. So we need to realize that's where we're headed. But having said that, um, obviously we know that the Lord is going to take care of us. He'll watch over us. He'll, he, will, um, he will be with us in that struggle. There's no need to think that in any way God will uh, abandon us. And, of course, gave examples of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Daniel, and Peter, James, and John, and, and others who were faithful to him and uh, in the cause. Now I want to look at, um, even though that injustice will prevail, um, yet God will not forsake us. He's not going to leave us. And that's another interesting concept. You know, we got to realize, um, you know, unfortunately, the sinful world we're living in, uh, don't expect justice. That's, that's sad, it, you know, because we are a people who love truth, righteousness, and hate injustice. We, we, we believe every person should be treated fairly. And it's very... Um, frustrating and very um, disappointing when injustice prevails. But that's something we have got to come to grips with. Don't expect to be treated fairly. Don't think that somehow you're going to be treated in um, the same way everybody else is going to be treated. It's not going to happen for God's people. Just as 
it was in, with Jesus it, during the Passover week when from the time of in the Garden of Gethsemane to right up to the crucifixion. I mean, and even actually during the time, he, of course, he was taunted. But even up to that point, dear friends, you got to remember throughout that whole period, Christ was constantly mistreated. The laws of the land were either um, twisted, denied, or broken. They did everything they could, both the Roman authorities and the Jewish authorities, in order to get Jesus Christ crucified. I mean, it was the injustice is just unbelievable. Um, and there's actually a little book written on that. I'm trying to think of the name. Behold the Man. I think that's what it's called. Behold the Man. It's a very good little book. Wow, what a fantastic book. Behold the Man. And um, uh, you, if you ever get it, it, it's well worth having. I can tell you that. I don't know. Maybe you might be able to uh, see if you can do a, a, a search, a Google search, put PDF after it. I think you can download it for free. I, I may be mistaking now, so just have to give it a chance. But it's called Behold the Man. And uh, it's a very, very good book. Let me see that. This is the paperback. Yeah, this is the paperback version. It's by Taylor G. Bunch. And uh, Behold the Man. You see Taylor G. Bunch, you can see it's kind of our book is all beat up and everything, as you can see. But um, I'm telling you right now, you're going to this book is one book you need to try to find. Behold the man. And it is all about the Passover week, what happened to Jesus, what they did to him. And I'll tell you something. Um it's really one of the best books you'll ever come across. You'll never regret getting this book. Never. Uh, that I can assure you. All right. Let's see. Let's, uh, well, let's go on. Let's, let's look at some statement here. The first statement I want to look at here is coming from Review and Herald, December 26, 1899. All right. And again, I would recommend um, going back and reading the whole article. Um, for those of you who are interested. And of course, the essence of what we're reading here is that uh, what happened to Christ, um, you must realize that if he's the master, don't think that just because, you know, you're the servant, somehow you're going to be treated less than. Uh, not so. Not so. Um, so, Bear, you know, be prepared. That's what I'm trying to encourage you to do. And I, again, I think I'm disappointed on one end regarding what has happened to us for the last year and a half or so. I'm also rejoicing um, in one way. And I'll tell you why I say that, because I'm rejoicing in this sense that it has, I, I, for me and others I've talked to, it's opened our eyes more so than they were before, because we're actually seeing, we're witnessing, we're experiencing um, a incident by the government whereby it is overstepping its boundaries and entered into the realm of worship. Uh, we're witnessing it. We're watching it. And um, I think there are those of us who are realizing, you know what? I, I, I better be ready. I've got to be ready at a moment's notice. I need to really do everything in my power to prepare because this to me, I think the Lord allowed this. I'm convinced that he allowed this to happen for a divine purpose because I think he knew we were all just lollygagging along or very few, very few exceptions, of course, I should maybe qualify. And, and yet we were just kind of lackadaisically just moving along in our Christian experience and God knew we needed to wake up. And, and I'll tell you what, dear friends, this should be an eye opener for everybody, everyone. I have a feeling, I hope I'm wrong, but if, we get past this, you know, I wouldn't put past the devil if he, if there was a lull, he, we go back to the way it was before, just kind of ease up. And what is that? That puts everybody back to sleep. 
And um, I hope not, but I think that's where we're at. So let's let, let me read you this statement. It says the followers, followers of Christ should bear in mind that the evil speech is made against Christ, the abuse he received, they also, as his followers, must endure for his sake. So again, that as the what the way they treated Christ, you've got to realize you're not going to be treated any differently. So <clears throat> The evil speeches made against him, the abuse he received. We also have to endure the same thing. And I'm going to tell you, you know, there have been times I I would go into stores not wearing my mask or in, uh, you know, or whatever, you know, doing certain things. I've had people well, look at me or say things to me. <laughs> it's not easy. I'll tell you something. I'm convinced moral courage is harder than, than in some ways than uh, than uh, having physical courage, you know. It's a, it's a hard, sometimes I'll, friends, I think we can all admit it's a hard thing to stand up for what's right because we're afraid or ashamed or embarrassed, but we have to do what's right. We've got to follow our conscience. And again, I go back to this issue. This whole issue for me is about worship and no one, I don't care who they are has any right to interfere in the realm of worship. God, and that's it. Not even you and me. Decision. What I do, that's my decision. And so you need to realize be of a high order but when the truth of the word of god is brought to bear upon the heart and when conviction of truth is rejected and despised that men may keep in friendship with the majority they place themselves on the side of the enemy and that's the that's it so you know when truth is brought home and then the conviction is rejected and despised that men may keep friendship with the majority. They've decided whose side they're on. They're on the enemy's side. Well, you know, I, I, I'm convicted. I, I'm convicted. I know it's the right thing, but I'm going to reject the truth. I'm going to despise it in order to do what? So I can keep friendship with the majority. I don't want to be the odd man out. I want everybody to like me. That's a very interesting concept regarding human nature. We are, are we're created by God. To have, you know, to be social creatures. You know, this is why monastery or the monastic life, you know, the, the monks and the nuns, that's, that's a, that type of lifestyle is not what God ever ordained for us. And it becomes a sinful lifestyle. It's a selfish lifestyle and it's a very corrupt lifestyle. And however, but there's something very interesting. We like to socialize. We like friendship, fellowship. And uh, some people, in order to keep that friendship, that fellowship, don't want to be embarrassed, don't want to be ostracized by society, are going to reject the truth, even though they're uh, in, in, under conviction. Then, of course, she quotes John 15, 18 to 25. Now, let's go to John 15. John chapter 15. Let's look at this. John 15. And we're looking here at 1825. Jesus said this. If the world hate you. You know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world. Uh, but I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said unto you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have, if they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. If I, had had, if I had not come and spoken unto them, 
They had not, not sinned. But now they have no cloak for their sin. He that hates me hates the Father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now they have both seen and hated both me and my Father. But this cometh to pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in the, their law. They hated me without a cause. So very interesting, again, what they did to Christ, Christ has warned us, he's told us, they're going to do to you and me. Listen to what the servant Lord says now. These words of Christ have been fulfilled in the experience of those who have been loyal to the God of heaven according to the light received. If they persecuted me, he said, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. All that will live, not merely profess to live, godly in Christ Jesus, shall suffer persecution. That's very interesting. It's not those who simply profess to be godly. It's those who live, who are godly, they will suffer persecution. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known by an experimental knowledge the Father nor me. That's a very interesting statement she put in there, by experimental knowledge. They have not known by experience. And again, you know, dear friends, when we're talking about this concept of experimental righteousness or experimental you know, knowledge of God, uh, this is you, you don't have to go to some third world country do missionary work and you know go some far off land to, to to experience god you can experience god from day to day by doing them just the simple chores of life by simply doing the faithful duties that god has called you to to do and um and again it, this goes right back to the issue of the parable of the ten virgins um remember the five wise the difference between them and the foolish was that they continued to develop an experiment, uh, experience with God. Um, and every day we can have an experience with God uh, every day. You know, you could be in a prison in and in, in bound up in a room and no one there with you. And you can still have an experience with God. You can be developing oil. And um, just so don't forget that. Keep keep developing that experience as christ was hated without a cause so will his people be hated because they are obedient to the commandments of god and that's the key what do they choose they're saying look we don't care what the majority think we don't care what everybody else believes we're going to follow the lord's commandments if he who is pure holy and undefiled who did good and only good in our world was treated as a base criminal condemned to death his disciples must expect but similar treatment however faultless may be their life and blameless their character you got to expect it dear friends we're going to have to make a decision at some point in time when are we going to stand for christ and during this time that we have now what a what an opportunity you know, it's an opportunity to stand for what's right, to do the right thing. Now, again, everybody's got to make up their minds. Everybody's got to decide for themselves. I'm five fool. I get that. I understand that. My, my decision isn't yours. I can say this. I'll say this, though. One thing is for sure. All of us better be following God. Everybody better, better be uh, uh, doing God's will. That is for sure. Um, but you know what? Look. I'm just here to share with you what God has placed in my heart. And I hope and pray to God somehow, some way, um, people are realizing that um, we're gonna, we better get busy. We better get moving. Uh, I've said this again I'll, uh, before, and I'm going to say it again. Um, this is a wake-up call. That's all I, I, I see. I, I, this is a wake-up call. And God help us. 
human enactments, laws manufactured by satanic agencies under the plea of goodness and restrict and restriction of evil will be exalted. Now I want you to think about that. Human enactments, laws manufactured. Now notice how they wrap these laws under the plea of goodness and restriction of evil. Oh, we're just thinking of your well-being. We want you to be safe. We don't want you to be sick. We want you to be well. We, we're only, that's why we're closing your churches down. That's why you can't sing a hymn. That's why you can't, you, you, you got to wear masks when you go into the church. And that's why you got to stay six feet apart. That's why you can only have 10 people in the church. And, and they go on down with their list. That's not why they're doing it. They don't care about your health. These are satanic laws they've enacted. And again, what is so frustrating, Seventh-day Adventists are gullible enough to believe it. That's what bothers me is that our people have blundered and the leadership for the most part has been, is, is guilty and that they, they have uh, capitulated their responsibility. Now, it doesn't surprise me in some sense. I guess what bothers me is the fact that they should be standing and defending the truth Instead, they've capitulated it, and they should have glorified God's name, but that's not what they chose to do. They, changed, they chose Caesar over God, and, um, and, and so here, notice how it's for your good, which we want you to be, in a, you know, stay safe, and, and we, we, we're trying to restrict this disease because it's evil. Oh, oh, you got to understand, well, look, we have to do this. She says, while God's holy commandments are despised and trampled underfoot. And that's exactly what they did. Can't go to church. They're trampling God's commandments. No, nah, can't worship. Can't go to church and worship God. No. Nah. And uh, I'm sorry, dear friends. Sometimes there's a price to pay for standing up for God. And this was one time we should have stood up and said, no, nah, we're not. We're not closing our churches. And everybody, as I said, if, you, if your churches, if the conference churches, if they don't want to open up, then, then start having home churches. Do what you've got to do. Get together. Don't stop having fellowship. Invite people to your home. Simple as that. You can't, you can't do it in your home. Do it out in the field. Can't do it there. Go into the woods. Can't do it there. Find a barn. I don't care. Find somewhere. Fellowship. Okay. I, I, I'm trying to be really calm. I believe me. I'm telling you. She says this, and all who prove their loyalty by obedience to the law of Jehovah must be prepared to be arrested. Did you catch that, dear friends? Did, did you all get that one? You understand what to expect. We know what to expect. We're not going to be treated any differently than Jesus. She says, you know what? Then you need to prepare yourself to be arrested. Because that's the consequences for those who are going to stand faithful to Jesus Christ. She says they must be prepared to be arrested, to be brought before councils that they have uh, that have not their standard of high and holy law of, uh, of God. So they don't have the standard of God's law as the means by which they're going to judge the case. The same spirit that moved the priests and rulers uh, had, had moved Cain to slay his brother. It is the apostasy. You can imagine the spirit these, these, these leaders are going to have, right? The same spirit that moved the priests, the same spirit that moved the, the Cain, was the same spirit that caused him to kill his brother. That's the kind of spirit we're going to confront in the halls of justice. So when you're in, if you're among the privileged who's going to be brought before the courts, listen very carefully. Don't expect justice. Don't expect it. If it happens, praise God. But if it, if it doesn't, don't be disappointed. Just realize that's the lot. And then you need to realize that God has something special for you in the work where, wherever you may be incarcerated. 
It is the apostasy from truth that works in the children of disobedience to silence the voice of those who are calling them to obedience. And that's the key. They need to silence your voice. But that's not going to happen. Uh, and today, this spirit is manifested in the churches that are trampling upon God, the word of God, transgressing his holy law. They know not what spirit they are of, nor the end of the dark tunnel through which they are passing. Deceived, deluded, blind, they are hastening forward to the first and second death. Man. The vast tide of human will and human passion is leading to things they did not dream of when uh, they would when they discarded the law of Jehovah for the inventions of men and the cause of oppression and suffering to human beings. The churches have been converted to the world. And that's right. Um, that's exactly that's really what's happened to us as our as a church. We have been converted to the world. Sorry, friends. That's exactly what many of the leadership in our churches has done. They have capitulated the truth. They're converted to the world. That's why they took the policy they did. And they show what they would do in this age if the world, uh, excuse me, uh, the churches have been converted to the world and they show what they would do in this age of the world if they dared. If Christ were in the world today, many would have no more desire for him than had the Jewish nation at his first advent. You think about that. And she's talking especially within the church, the Christian church, particularly among Seventh-day Adventists. Many would not desire him. They would have no more desire for him if Christ were here today. They would do as, the, as did the Jews. Man. Were it in their power, they would crucify Christ because he tells them the truth. That's the spirit that lives in the world and sadly to say in many in the church. Many are being educated up to this point. Now, that's very, did you catch that? Many are being educated up to this point. Up to what point? Up to the point of crucifying Christ. So think about what's been happening in the last year and a half. You know what's been happening? You may not realize it, dear friends, but we've been educated. Or they're at least trying to indoctrinate you. They're educating people to accept, surrender your religious convictions. That's what we've been educated in the last year and a half. Many Christians have been educated to surrender their religious convictions. Don't go to church. Oh, 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 okay, 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 because it's dangerous for you. Oh, 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 and by the way, can't don't sing hymns. Oh, all right. Okay. Oh, and by the way, uh, um, you got to wear masks. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, and you got to be six feet apart. Oh, all right. All right. Oh, and only 10 people. Yes, yes, master. What else do you want us to do? And uh, yeah, oh, and, and, and in the magazine, you know what you know what it says here in the magazine I showed you earlier today? You know what it says? Very, you know, sad tragedy. Our own church is saying, don't have communion. Ha, you know, take it into your house if you want to, but don't, you know, not in the church. Communion, communion. That's not a suggestion. You know, Christ, when he told us to have communion, that's not a suggestion. He said, you do that till I come. We as a church and, and as a people, as society, we've been educated up to this point. Up to what point? To crucify Christ. You say, well, I, I am. I, Ray, I don't hate God. You, know, you don't have to have um, a, you know, this, this great animosity that we often think of in regarding the nature of, 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 of our attitude towards Christ. Every time you, you reject God, you're manifesting a hatred towards God because you're choosing God or Satan. It's one of the two. But it's very interesting the language she uses. Many are being educated up to this point. And that's what's been happening to us in the last year and a half. We've been educated by the government and by the national media 
and by the lies that they've been telling every day, day after day about what's been going on. They don't want the truth to come out for if the truth comes out, they will be exposed. Perhaps even the people might dare to rise up and overthrow the tyranny. That's what they're afraid of. An independent, free-thinking, liberty-loving people. They despise it. Governments, though ordained by God, are instruments of tyranny when in the hands of a tyrant. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you, the governments of the world, with no exceptions, are, are governments of tyranny and oppression. It's because we have dictators, tyrants, people demonically possessed governing the people of the world. And uh, we've been educated. Well, I can tell you this, dear friends, some of us need to be re-educated in the cause of God. We need to be re-educated in the things of God. She goes on to say, rulers and teachers who, uh, who have caused souls to stumble over their perverted teachings, all persons who might have understood the prophecies, but who do not read and search to see if they are applicable to this time and concerned with their individual selves will be taken in the snare and suffer eternal loss. They will suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. Review and Herald, December 26, 1899. Please go back, read the entire article. It's loaded. But do as you please. And that is explosive. That statement there, I tell you, is an eye opener. Be prepared to be arrested. What they did to Jesus, they're going to do to you. And uh, we're being educated to the point where, where we are going to crucify Christ. And if you're not careful, dear friends, if you're not watching and praying, you're going to be the ones, you know, who end up doing it. And God help us. May we never come to that point. Then I want to read the next statement. This comes from Signs of the Times, May 26, 1898. And this is in the courts of justice. Um, it, excuse me, in the courts, injustice will prevail. And that's what I was telling you. Of course, we read reference to what Jesus said in Matthew, uh, John 15. But listen very carefully. The world is fast becoming as it was before the flood. And boy, I'll tell you something right now. The perversity of, of society, this, this, uh, I don't know, what's, what is it? The BGTLQ, GP, whatever the perverted organization, transgender, bisexual, whatever. Listen, I'm sorry. Listen. Biblically, scientifically, there's only two sexes, men and women, male, female. That's it. There's no third option. Okay. They're sorry. Don't care. That's the way it is. There's only two options, male, female. That's it. That's science, dear friends. Even if you're secular and you don't believe in God, let's go with science. <clears throat> And we are fast becoming <clears throat> like, like the world was before the flood. We are. We are a, a society that is, you know, when the Bible says, it, it says they were eating and drinking and, and, and self-indulgent. That's really what it talks about when he's, in the days of Noah. They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving until the day that Noah entered the ark. It's talking about self-indulgent society, a society that doesn't want restraints. You know, that's where we are at. We're at, at a point where society no longer wants moral restraint. Don't tell me how I can live. Don't tell me what I can do or where I can go, what I can say and, 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 uh, um, um, and, and how I can live and, you know, and, and so on and so on. It's, it's absolutely uh, a society that is morally bankrupt. We are morally bankrupt as a society. She goes on to say, Satan has, has set up his throne on the earth, and the law of God is trampled underfoot. Laws enacted by finite authority are exalted above the law of Jehovah. Men trample underfoot God's holy law and say of God's people, as the Jews said of, of Christ, we have a law, and by our law, 
he ought to die. Over and over again, this will be repeated. Did you all hear that? Over and over again, this will be repeated. Satan is going to, time and time again, bring up issues that the laws of the land will conflict with the laws of God. And every time it does, they're going to come out and say, you know, we've got a law that says these people ought to die. We, we ought to punish these people. This is going to come again and again and again and again. So don't expect this. We are, we're, we're going through COVID. We're going through it. Don't think this is going to end. There's going to be something coming down the pike. You can better believe that. You can better believe it, dear friends. Christ has told us that in the world we shall have tribulation, but that in him we shall have peace. Praise God, what a blessing to have the reassurance of knowing that despite all of this, God's going to keep us in perfect peace and uh, help us through a crisis. And I'm sure each and every one of us at some point have gone through something that we consider, you know, a tribulation or an affliction or suffering trials. And we can all say, I think that we can all say that we've gone through um, that trial and the Lord has, has wrought in our behalf. He's done something miraculous and he's kept us. I know I can. I just multiple occasions I can recall. And I thank God for that. And those are simply stepping stones to prepare you for, for the greater one. She goes on to say, those who are living during the last days of Earth's history will know what it means to be persecuted for the truth's sake. And in the courts, injustice will prevail. In the courts, injustice will prevail. I'm going to read that one more time. In the courts, injustice will prevail. Don't expect to be treated fairly. The judges will refuse to listen to the reasons of those who are loyal to the commandments of God. Now imagine a judge not wanting to be fair. She goes on to say, because they know that the arguments in favor of the fourth commandment are unanswerable. They know it. That's why they don't want to hear it. They will say, we have a law and, on our, and by our law, he ought to die. <laughs> That's all they're going to do is look at the law laws on the books and they're going to say, uh, yeah, well, I don't care what you think about your opinion about the, the fourth commandment. Doesn't matter. Don't care. Um, uh, we're going to, uh, you know what, we're going to just buy by the laws of the book. You got to die. And again, I go back to that statement she made a little earlier. Let me go back one more slide on, on the latter part of that statement. Say over and over again, this will be repeated. This is coming back again and again and again until they come to the Sunday law issue and they're going to, that's it. It's going to come down the pike. And then as many will be martyrs. Revelation 20 verse four says many will be beheaded. Uh, let's see. Um, they ought to die. God's law is nothing to them. And that's really what it comes down to. And this is, and these are judges. It doesn't, God's law means nothing to them. Uh, our law with them is supreme. Notice our law with them is supreme. Uh, those who respect this human law will be favored. See, our law with them is supreme. Those who respect this human law will be favored, but those who will not bow to the idol Sabbath will have no favors shown them. And that's where we're headed. That's the end road. Satan knows that. Every one of us who studied these issues knows that. But I think many of us have forgotten. And in the process of forgetting, Satan came up upon us. And uh, like I said before, it brought a test case. And sadly, many, many. Uh, and, and our leadership, especially, they failed. They, they utterly failed. And it's a sad tragedy, but that's a fact. 
Let's go down. Great controversy, page 601 and 602. Um, when the testing time shall come. We, she says, we are living in the most solemn period of this world's history. The destiny of Earth's teeming multitudes is about to be decided. You know, now more than ever, when I read things like this in the light of what's happened in the last year and a half, you can see it. You can see it happening. You, you can actually visualize. Yeah, yeah, I could see that. Yeah, I can see that taking place. Yeah, that's that's yeah. All they're going to do is get some kind of a crisis and scare everybody into submission and through the national media. And by the way, don't think that's going to change. They're all liars. Every network, every news agency, they're all lying to you. No one is telling you. They, it's either slip of the tongue or uh, they've got an ulterior motive. I mean, looks, dear friends, I'm telling you now that you got to, as Sister White says, and I've shared, I said this before, you got to start thinking for yourselves now more than you've ever done before. You've got to start thinking for yourselves and you can, and, and more than ever before, you've got to realize I cannot trust the leadership in the church. Can't trust them. Can't trust my pastors. Can't trust, I'm sorry. Can't trust the elders. I got to trust Christ. You, you're going to have to realize that's where it's at. Um, because very few are crying, uh, uh, crying out. Very few. And thank God for those who are. Praise, praise the Lord. Praise God. Uh, <clears throat> the destiny of earth's teeming multitudes is about to be decided. Our own future well-being and also the salvation of other souls depend upon the course which we are now, which we now pursue. Very interesting. So the decisions you make today determine, you know, what will be tomorrow. And I've said that multitude times, you know, you got to realize that. We need to be guided by the spirit of truth. Amen. Every follower of Christ should earnestly inquire, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Lord, what should I do? We need to humble ourselves before the Lord with fasting and prayer and to meditate much upon his word for sure. Amen. Especially upon the scenes of the judgment. We should now seek a deep and living experience in the things of God. We have not a moment to lose. Events of vital importance are taking place around us. And brothers and sisters, if God could... If he would open the veil, you know, what's really going on behind closed doors in the government, I think we would be horrified. I think we'd be absolutely horrified. But see, what this is, has done is showing you now you, we have a living demonstration, evidence now that cannot be refuted, that they don't care and they don't mind and they absolutely have no conscious uh, a consciousness about it where they are willing to restrict you of your religious freedoms. They don't care. Now, there are, thank God, some politicians I know in the United States, I'd like to think there are some in the UK who are, who've been raising a voice of opposition. Of course, they're not going to let them be known on television. You know, they're not the national media is not going to, you know, bring them to light because they don't want anybody to focus on that. But um, there are a few exceptions. And thank God for the few, but it's it's a shame. Um, Um, we have not a moment to lose. Events of vital importance are taking place around us. We are, we are on Satan's enchanted ground. And that's another interesting concept. We got to realize, dear friends, what's happening here. The, you know, God owns this world. It's his world. Christ created it and then he redeemed it um, and bought it back uh, through, through Calvary and reclaimed it. It's his, no doubt about it. But Remember, the scripture says Satan is Lord of this world, meaning he claims to be Lord of this world. And he's fighting. This is his dominion. We're in the battlefield. This is the battlefield, this world. 
Um, and, uh, and we're on enchanted ground, Satan's enchanted ground. So what does she say? Sleep not sentinels of God. Don't sleep. Don't fall asleep. The foe is lurking near ready at any moment. Should you be lax and drowsy to spring upon you and make you his prey? He's just waiting. He's just waiting for you to lull yourselves to sleep. And that's why I say, I thank God that this crisis has come because it, it should be an eye opener for, to everyone. Look and observe carefully to what extent the government, the media will go to and lie to you. Look, look at what they're doing. They've been lying every single day for a year and a half or more. They've been lying every day over this COVID crisis, every day. And they're still lying. Even though the truth is starting to creak out, you know, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, and you can go down to all these, I don't know, all these social media places, but I can tell you this, they are silencing anyone, anyone who has a different opinion regarding COVID, the um, scientific evidence uh, of, of uh, the vaccines, and exposing uh uh, the World Health Organization, the CDC, uh, Wuhan lab in China, um, Dr. Fauci, and the whole list of them. They are, they are silencing them. They don't want any of this to get out. Now, you got to ask yourself a question, friends. Why? If they are telling us the truth, why don't they want this to get out? It's because, dear friends, they're not telling you the truth. They're lying to you. They know they're lying. And that's to keep you deceived. And so Satan wants to lull us to sleep and in so doing to bring you to utter ruin and destruction. <clears throat> Many are deceived as to their true condition before God. And that's, that's the sad tragedy. And that's Laodicea. Many are deceived as to their true condition before God. They don't realize they're not as safe as they think they are. They congratulate themselves upon the wrong acts which they do not commit and forget to enumerate the good and noble deeds which God requires of them. Well, I didn't do this. See, I, I, I didn't. I mean, I'm not committing adultery. So I didn't do that. But here's the thing. They, they forget to enumerate the good and noble deeds which God requires of them. Yeah, okay, you didn't do that. Okay, you didn't do this. In other words, you didn't do X, Y, and Z, right? You didn't do X, Y, and Z. But the question I want to ask you is, did you do A, B, and C? See, God required you to do something. And so they take so, well, you know, what? I didn't do, I, hey, I'm not doing that. I am not committing that crime. I'm not doing that. Okay, well, that's wonderful. Okay. But did you do the things that God required of you? That's the key. <clears throat> she says uh, uh good and noble deeds uh, uh that god requires of them but which they didn't have neglected to perform it is not enough that they are trees in the garden of god it's not enough that you're a tree in the garden of god they are to answer his expectation of bearing fruit so but i'm i, I'm, I go to church well so and yeah okay that's okay the question is, are you bearing fruit? It's not enough that you're a tree in the garden of God. I love that statement. I love the way she phrases that. Not enough that you're a tree in the garden of God. And the question is, are you bearing fruit? I don't do those evil deeds. Okay, well, that's wonderful. That's good. Okay. Question is, are you, are, but are you doing what God requires? She goes on to say, he holds them accountable for their failure to accomplish all the good which they could have done. See that? It's not just the evil you didn't do. It's what you could have done. He holds you accountable. Through, the, through his grace, um, which they could have done through his grace, strengthening them. In the books of heaven, they are registered as cumbers of the ground. That's unbelievable. You're taking up space. You're cumbers of the ground. You're a nuisance in that sense. You're friends. These are people professing to be children of God, claiming that they're Christians, 
And yet they take solace in themselves saying, you know what, I'll, I don't do this and that and, you know, that evil thing. Okay, but they're not doing what God requires. They're failing, they have a failure to accomplish that which God required of them. And they're going to be held accountable. And in the eyes of God, you know what they are? They're trees in the garden, but they don't bear fruit. You know what happens? They're going to, they're going to get cut down. She goes on to say, yet the case is even, uh, uh, excuse me, yet the case of, of even this class is not utterly hopeless. Amen. With those who have been slighted, excuse me, with those who have slighted God's mercy and abused his grace, the heart of the long suffering love yet pleads. So God still is pleading. You, 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 you've not taken advantage of God. Uh, of his mercy and his and his grace to 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 do the things that God requires. So let's get busy doing what it is that God has asked us to do. Just because you don't do certain evil things doesn't mean you're doing what it is that God requires you in the fullest extent. You're doing some things, yes, but you're not doing everything that God requires. She goes on to say, quoting Ephesians 5, 14 to 16, therefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Friends, we awake from our spiritual death, you know, this spiritual lethargy that has taken possession of many of God's people. It's time that we wake up and realize the consequences. And realize, dear God, Christ can redeem us. He can heal us. He can forgive us. He can help us through our crisis. He can help us through this issue. We may have let him down. Every, listen, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But that doesn't mean you have to stay in that condition, dear friends. You don't have to do it. In closing, listen to this, Rick, carefully. Listen, when the testing time shall come. Those who have made God's word their rule of life will be revealed. Now, that's interesting. Those who have made the word of God the rule of their life. They, they, I'm going to follow the Lord. I'm going to do the Lord's will. When the testing time comes, is of course, Sunday Sabbath issue. She says, then they will be revealed. See, right now, we don't know who's who, right? We're not aware of that. But, but when that time comes, we're going to find out. Which one of us is really God's children? Who's really the child of the Lord? In the summer, there is no noticeable difference between the evergreens and the other trees, right? Because they're all green. So you don't, right? They're all alive. But when the blast of winter comes, the evergreens remain unchanged while the other trees are stripped of their foliage. So the false hearted professor may not now be distinguished from the real Christian, but the time is just upon us when the difference will be apparent. Let opposition arise. Let bigotry and intolerance again bear sway. Let persecution be kindled, and the half-hearted and hypocritical will waver and yield the faith. But the true Christian will stand firm as a rock and his faith stronger is hope brighter than the days of prosperity. Great Conifers, page 601, 602. And so we're headed towards a crisis. And over and over again, this, a crisis is going to come. And every time and time again, they're going to keep bringing back this issue. And it's all going to come down to the issue that we, you got to realize we're going to face persecution, prosecution. Um, by the civil authorities, and you're not going to expect find justice. You're not going to get it. Don't expect it. And um, and God help us, dear friends. Jesus is coming. Let us do everything we can to redeem the time. Let us put our faith in Christ. Be reassured, dear friends, that even if we have, you know, failed our Lord, fallen short of His glory. He doesn't, um, he doesn't hate us. He's not looking out to get us. But he's trying everything he can to help us realize that he wants us in heaven with him. Friends, I want to appeal with you. 
Be faithful to the Lord. Do all that you can. And be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. Don't be foolish, but do what the Lord requires of you. Men, I'm going to appeal to you. Go back and read and study carefully Daniel chapter 3 and Daniel chapter 6. Read Acts 4 and 5 and go into the spirit of prophecy and carefully meditate. See, the issue in the last days, it, it, it is over worship. Revelation 13 repeats its four or five times. Worship, 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 worship. It's all about worship. We often think as Seventh-day Adventists, it only has to do with the Sabbath. That's not true. That's not true at all. In Daniel 3, it was bowing down to an image and worshiping the image. That's, you know, that's a violation of the first and second commandment. In Daniel chapter 6, Daniel couldn't pray. Right? He couldn't pray. I mean... In both cases, dear friends, it had nothing to do with the Seventh-day Sabbath. The, the governments of the land in, 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 uh, in their day wasn't telling them they couldn't go to church on the Sabbath day. They said they just, you know what, you're going to worship this image or you're going to you, uh, pray only to the king. In other words, the king is, is put in the place of God. It's the same thing as the image, the concept. But it all has to do with worship. In, in Acts 4 and 5, the disciples were told, you can't, you can't preach in the name of Jesus. You can't even mention his name. They had, each one had to make a decision. They were at a crossroads. What are they going to do? And, um, and uh, you got to realize, dear friend, it all is about worship. In the last days, just before Christ comes, there's going to be the climactic issue over worship. And this is going to uh, revolve around Sunday Sabbath issue. That's what it's going to come down to. And this is what I've been trying to tell people. You go study the Reformation carefully. Read it carefully. Luther, Calvin, Knox, the Hussites, the Waldensians, and stuff. They weren't being persecuted, uh, um, you know, generally speaking, uh, because they, they couldn't go to church on the Sabbath. Not to say the Sabbath keepers weren't persecuted. That's, that's very clear. But generally speaking, what you have, dear friends, is they wanted to worship God according to the dictates of their conscience. They fought for, for religious freedom. It, the whole issue of the Reformation was about worshiping God freely. And um, I'm sorry. I disagree with some of our brethren. And that's as simple as that. I'm sorry. I can't comply. And by the grace of God, I pray I, I'll be faithful. I want to encourage you. Hang in there. And thank you for everyone, your words of encouragement, for your prayers. I appreciate so much your kindness. And, uh, and I really do appreciate uh, even those of you, some of you, you've been very kind in contrib contributing to uh, the ministry and the cause uh, that God has given to us. I appreciate it so much. But I want to tell you, dear friends, let's do all that we can and uh, to, to put Christ first and to finish this work on this earth. Let us pray. Father in heaven, again, we thank you for all you've done and continue to do for us. Bless us now and keep us. May your angels watch over us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.